So one day is Thursday, August 10th, 2023, and this is the week and charts. I'll be sure to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I know I didn't get the word out today, but if you are watching on Facebook, if you go to daylearner.com slash webinar, register for one, register, you're registered for all. You can go down below in the comment section and or the more information segment on this video and get all the links down there. So we're going to talk about, well, obviously current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. I'm going to pull in my horns a little bit this week, and I'm going to show you why in a few minutes. Your questions on trading and your favorite stock and crypto picks. So what we're going to focus on, well, postmortems are great, but I think this is even better. And that's based on a question I received this week, and that'll make a little more sense in a few minutes. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know. You can lose money trading, or as often sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Thank you, Greg Morris, for giving me that. All right, let's take a look at this week's mailbag. Uh, you guys here know this, but I do have a Facebook group, and in that group, I field questions during the week. But every now and then, if something requires a little bit more thought, uh, I'll talk about it in the week of charts. So, how is asking? You talked a lot about how the market spends a lot of time backing and filling. I forgot who you quoted to reference this. Uh, might have been Greg Morris that said markets make new highs only 4% of the time. That's uh, more than likely. Can you complete, Can you compare this to the past core trading recommendations that have closed out? I believe they are VRM, Riot, BTPT, EOS, SYM, second play, SYM first. To me, it looks like the past couple of weeks we were spent back in filling. The action happened close enough to our entry. I'll stop to not have enough time to widen out. Please walk us through and demonstrate how you would take notes through deliberate practice. Well, the quick answer on that is I give positions what I believe to be enough room, and then we let the chips fall where they may, and then I gradually let that stop loosen up over time. And then, as you alluded to, sometimes not enough time transpires for that tie, and not enough point move too for that stop to get wide enough to ride out these longer term corrections. But I kind of make my decisions and live with them. And a lot of that comes within the pre-mortem and that's gonna make a lot more sense in a few minutes. So I wanted him to elaborate a little bit more on what he was saying. And he says, uh, I'm wondering what your journal entries look like with your honest post-mortems on the trades. For example, do you evaluate the stop locations, the entry locations, were they too close, just right? Were there some setup that you should have taken in hindsight? Do you have a screenshot of your journal that you could share to demonstrate your that demonstrates how your post more or demonstrates how you record your post mortem. These for me to say. Okay, convention time. I haven't done a lot of time documenting post mortems. I've been working more and more on pre mortems, which is becoming more and more important. Now this is something that I that I thought I was, I was only doing recently, but I've actually been doing this. I, I found some slides which I'm gonna show you here in just one second, going back several years. So we can certainly come back and revisit the postmortems, but for now, I think it's important to, to work on the pre-mortems. Now, I thought I came up with the term pre-mortem and I felt like I've, I've only been doing this, talking about pre-mortems for a, a short period of time. And then I was reading Annie Duke's book how to make how to decide and initially i wasn't too keen on the book but after i started reading it or rereading it i started getting into it more and more and she talks about a pre-mortem and i really like her definition and she got the term pre-mortem from gary klein and i figured out that that was from something he wrote in 2019 and i found slides from 2019 so it doesn't matter who came up with the term. I like the term. I like the fact that other people are using it. I will give Mr. Klein, because I like Gary Klein as an author, and uh, Miss Duke, I like Miss Duke too. I'll give those guys credit too. And it's, uh, it, in a way, it, it makes me feel good that they too are talking about the pre-mortem. Now, I like the way Annie Duke uh, defined it. Imagine yourself at some time in the future having failed to achieve a goal and looking back at how you arrived at that destination. Her point in, in kind of building up the pre-mortem was instead of doing a post-mortem when somebody dies, 
let's check them out while they're still alive so we can figure out what they likely died from. And you can get a lot more information from a living person, obviously, than a dead person. I guess there's certain things you couldn't get, but you kind of get the idea. Now, I went back in time, and, I, and like I said, I found some slides from 2019 where I was talking a, a lot about the pre-mortem. And, and like Ms. Duke says, it's you're imagining yourself sometime in the future. Well, I'm always talking about time travel when it comes to trading. Now, you can't actually time travel, but you can you could do some of these things in your head. So imagine imagining yourself at some point in the future, that would be after the trade is done. And it's a losing trade and looking back at how you arrived at that destination. So again, getting back to the time travel, is present Dave going to make future Dave mad? And if I really, really like a setup and it doesn't work, I drop an F-bomb, but I am confident enough in the setup that I felt like it was worth taking and I had to take it. There's always gonna be a hindsight bias and there's a, there's a lot of different ways of looking at hindsight bias, or I should say there's different types of hindsight bias. And one of the hindsight biases is after all is said and done, the dust settles, let's say you lose money in a trade, you go back and you're like, well, geez, this really wasn't that great of a setup. The acceleration wasn't there, persistency wasn't there, it did trade cleanly, it didn't pull back deep enough, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you need to work through all those things ahead of time. And you really need to, as you'll see in a few minutes, you really need to feel that F yeah feeling. Now, trading is not a lot like life, and that's why it's hard to do. But like life, if you boil it all down, it's making decisions and living with them. Making decisions is easy. Living with them is not. Usually I make a joke at my wife's expense, but we'll save that for an in-person presentation. <laughs> so this is a slide that sort of dovetails in. I know they say it's a game when it comes to psychology, but I never really mastered it. I still do not know how to stay bored, et cetera. Disinterested when I am losing my account. Indeed, it is unnatural. Now, I'm assuming this came from, from a client. And my answer to this is do a pre-mortem. And that's where you, you have to say, is it's really the best of the best? All those things I just said, acceleration, persistency. And I'm gonna show you a couple setups here and what I said about them ahead of time. But you really wanna ask, is this really the best of the best and one way to sort of do that time travel is and it's a bit negative but imagine yourself losing on the trade okay so let's say 100k account you're putting up two percent of your account you're gonna lose two thousand dollars if you lose so you have to be looking at this trade and thinking f yeah if you're gonna put two percent of a 100k account in just two thousand dollars more if you have a bigger account, obviously, less if it's a small account. And you have to go through that thought process in your mind and make sure that you think it's worthwhile. Now, one thing I would I would suggest is, are you clinically dispassionate? And I get that from Larry Williams. To make money as a trader, you have to not care. As soon as you start caring, you have emotional attachment. It's counterintuitive. The more you care, the less you make. The more you are clinically dispassionate and less attached to your trades, the more you will make. It's really quite simple, but very hard to accept. When trading is going well, I am very clinically dispassionate. I lose one trade, I don't, I don't care, because five other trades are going to work out, or one out of the next five trades is going to work out so big, it doesn't matter. Now, it's not always like that, obviously, and with the momentum stuff, especially lately, it's been kind of volatile. We we caught a few big winners here and there, but boy, we got whacked on them too. So it is it is a little bumpy. So now's not one of those times where I'm really clinically dispassionate and I'm a very emotional guy. I I get uh, I get flimped when I'm forced to watch a Nicholas Sparks movie or sometimes I watch those Formula One 
documentaries, if you ever watch those, they, they usually end badly. Schumacher, Schumacher, or Schumacher, Schumacher um, was a good one. Uh, watch Cena first. Uh, Cena was really, really good. And Schumacher, it sounds like it's saying Schumacher. Schumacher? I hope I'm saying his name right, but um, he was he was a big fan of Cena. He actually had Cena posters posters when he grew up as a kid. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. ADD's kicking in, but uh, I'm a very emotional guy, and I have to and I've learned how to embrace that. This presentation that this came from talked a lot about me taking uh, um, a personality test and found out and I found out that my agreeableness was pretty much zero. Yeah, Cena was amazing, really amazing. Now. In becoming clinically dispassionate, as one client once said, I'm going to go do something far more interesting because there were no setups, but try to let things just work their way out. I know easier said than done. I keep a, a, a I, I, I look at the balances on and off all day long, you know. But as one client said, he's going to go do something that's far more interesting. And you have to embrace and accept the unnatural shit happens, okay? And it doesn't mean that you made a bad decision just because the decision didn't go your way. Now, you really need to document before the trade. It's almost like one way to think about your pre-mortem is you could almost take your pre-mortem and put it as your post-mortem. In other words, this trade looks good because... And then you can, in the pre-mortem, think, okay, I, I lost, I failed miserably, so what? It was worth taking, okay? So your post-mortem is almost like cut that and paste that if you fail miserably, or if it takes off, you say, well, okay, well, I knew it was a good setup, and I said it was a good setup ahead of time. So I think where I'm getting with this is I'm spending less and less time on my pre-mortem. Now, I know Hal was asking about my reevaluations of entries and stops and all. It's like, well... I think you reach a point where you know where the volatility of the market is, and you know you're outside of that volatility. All the things we talk about, higher HV stocks are, require more room. If you go in and watch the service archives for the SIM trade, for instance, the first trade, we went back to it. I'll, I'll get to the trade in just one second if you hang in there. <laughs> but the first trade, we were risking like five points in change, and the second point trade was like 10 points in trade. While the volatility increased in the stock, the price increased on the stock, so my volatility went up in kind. So I've got a pretty good feel for that. Um, as one of my clients says, that might be one of those things that's caught, not taught. But if you go in as painful as it would be and watch as many of those archives as you could stand, you could say, okay, Dave's using a five-point stop. Why did he pick five points? Where would that position fail? Oh, okay, it would look like it would fail about four and a half points or so. It looks like five points would be about right, and so on and so forth. But uh, make sure you ask yourself, what are you seeing that that no one else is? Why does this setup look so great? And one thing I've been kind of thinking about is like try to find a way to detach yourself from it. Now, the I know everybody doesn't have access to the Facebook group, but if you had, but if you're in the group and you like a setup, throw it out there and and let us noodle with a little bit. And sometimes you get a little a little caught up. You're right here. You're not seeing the forest for the trees, and they might be a big old mound of overhead supply like right back here that you're not seeing but the main thing is you have to feel that f yeah and then you also have to ask yourself is this trade so great that you're willing to put capital in the harm's way so part of the pre-mortem is yes writing the post-mortem ahead of time but it's also a lot of of justifying the trade to begin with in other words like I often say Papa John would be a good trader, better ingredients, better pizza, okay? So again, if you're feeling F, yeah, that it's worth trading on anything less, pass. And, and somebody emailed me a while back because I went a long time without recommending too many setups, and that's when the market was just chopping around and all over the place and still in the bear market or whatever. And I couldn't find a setup to save my life, and I don't want to put my capital in harm's way, and I don't want to recommend something to have one of you guys or gals get hurt, so I wasn't doing much. And and somebody said, I think you're you've become too selective to a fault. And I took that as a compliment. Less less is more when it comes to trading. And, and you know, lately I've been kind of guilty of trying to catch every zig and zag. And 
and, and failing miserably. And then it's like I checked the the portfolio of my position trades, and on a good day, it's just amazing how much it'll go up. And then taking these profits, and then getting stopped out at profits, and so on and so forth. It's like, well, why am I spending all this time eating, uh, ruining my mental capital here, or um, uh, discipline, which gets used up? Why am I spending all this time doing these things, trying to catch every zig and zag? when the real money is in these longer term trends and this is what I should be doing. I know I just digressed a little bit, but the documenting is is vitally important and you wanna document as much as possible. And then I'm gonna rewind this to in a minute and, and talk a little bit more about documenting your life. Now, I found this slide and I thought it was relevant. So we're kind of doomed from the start. Curtis Faith, the brain is not designed to process the type of low probability outcomes that traders often encounter where losing is part of the game. So that kind of circles back to you had a, a, an FES setup and it fails miserably. Well, you have to tell yourself, it's like, okay, well, go back to day one. And that's that's the biggest part of the post mortem, by the way is you back your chart out to the original setup. Well, I spent so much time in the original setup, I know it's already there. I mean, I do look at it after the fact, don't get me wrong, but I spent so much time looking at it initially that I've already convinced myself it's an FES setup and then I go with it, right? So if I lose on it, I might get frustrated and it might wake me up to like, well, hang on, let's take a look at what's going on in the markets, take a look at what's going on in the sectors. Am I seeing setups or, or not? And lately it's gotten a little bumpy here and there, it's like, okay, well, the market's not doing so great, and I've been noticing that. But like Mr. Faye says, our brain's just not wired to deal with these low probability type of outcomes. It's like if A, then B is how people like to think. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't work in the markets. And even system, mechanical system people, they'll they'll say, well, my edge is this percent. And it's like, well, they don't know that, okay? Because the markets are fluid, obviously. And if you knew, as I think I said last week or week before, if you knew you had a, the tiniest of all edges and you knew that it would stay statistically valid, then you should take all the money you have and trade that system. But markets aren't normally distributed, so you don't know what's going to work and what's not. Now, I know the probabilities are probably in my favor if it's a good looking setup, but sometimes even the best looking setups will fail. And Mark Douglas was part of that presentation. So it's hard to not quote Mark Douglas when you start talking about psychology. If you can put on a trade without hesitation, take it off without emotional discomfort, then you have accepted the risk. Amen, my brother from another brother, mother. <laughs> Mark's no longer with us, unfortunately. I met him once via a telephone con conversation, and uh, we were supposed to do some business together through a third party. It never did work out. For whatever reasons, but I regret not staying in touch with him, obviously. You always think you have unlimited time with with, uh, with everyone, but you don't. Okay, womp womp. <laughs> but anyway, this quote sort of haunts me sometimes when I'm when I'm screaming and cussing and, and dropping F-bombs. Not so much in the core methodology because I'm forced to make sure that I'm picking the best of the best because not only am I going to put my capital in harm's way, I don't want to look like an idiot to my clients and I don't want my clients to lose money. But amen, that's a that's a quote you probably need to stick to your uh, trading monitor. So you want to justify your setups. Now this is a dated example, but I thought it kind of made sense to, or I thought it sort of made sense along with this presentation because I talked a lot of about pre mortems back in that presentation. And back in that presentation, I was talking about, I think this was done for Trading Simplified. If you go in and look at their archives, you can find it. But I was talking about the must-take trade, the FEI trade versus the mistake trade. So this is a dated example, I know, but I have some newer ones to show you this week. And if you go in and watch that video at this link right here, I said, very, very, very nice persistent trend followed by a very orderly pullback, a little bit of a knockout move on the last bar. So I like that exclamation point. So 
what I was saying was obviously a serious trend in place. You've got the Landry lights, as you can see about the 30 EMA, and pull back to the 30 EMA, Landry light goes to zero, just a good looking setup. And the persistency, notice that it tends to go up bar after bar after bar after bar after bar. It was just a good looking stock, as I said, and again, pulls back to the moving average. Now, let's take a look at what happened. So the entry was here, stop was down there, and you could see it kind of failed miserably to begin with, even though it was a great setup. We hit that IPT. We took off half the share, so it's 1,000 per 100K. And at that point, the stop is brought up to break even. And then you can see we got stopped out for zero on the remainder. Well, it's better than the poke in the eye. But going into this trade, I thought it was a great trade. I thought it was worth taking. I took it myself. And again, ended up with a better than the poking eye trade. Now, let me show you something more recent. This is uh, SYM, which Hal mentioned. Okay, notice you've got a nice accelerating uptrend. Notice the persistency, meaning that the stock goes up day after day after day. And, you know, this is one of those hindsight things that I, I wish I would have done. But I remember lately I've been getting slightly more um, active in Twitter. And it's at T following moron is my Twitter handle. But I've been getting a little more active. And, and one thing I said to myself is like, I really need to post this setup and talk about why I like it because it's a really good looking setup. You had kind of a gradual trend, nothing to, nothing to trade there. But then it began to accelerate higher and persist. And then of course it pulls back to 30 EMA. It's just a good looking setup. So the entry was here, IPT was here, stop was down here. Now I went and looked at the archives for the first day I recommended this. And I said, nice little TKO type of move. I like these big fat TKOs. That would be this wide range bar down here, okay? The great thing, thing, the great thing about these wide range bar down TKOs is that sometimes they keep imploding, but you do not get an entry. In other words, no capital is put in harm's way. Now, the next day, and then triggered, I think, on the third day, still looks pretty good, or really good, I should say. Nice little acceleration higher, nice little deep pullback. That's just a good looking setup there. So this is one in more recent times where I remember really, really talking it up because I really, really liked it. Now the second setup was here and same sort of action had happened. It had a nice uptrend higher, nice persistent uptrend higher. It didn't pull back to the 30 EMA. We got uh, kind of nicked out of that. And I think that's what Hal might've been referring to do I feel like I adjusted a stop too high on that? It's like, no, because that stop was pretty darn wide at that point in time. And and in hindsight, yeah, it would have been nice not to get stopped out with uh, because we had more shares on back here. If you go in and watch the archives for this day here, which is July, I forget, uh, oh, late June, early July, like July 3rd would be the date, uh, but it went out like on the, weekend before whenever the 4th of July was, uh, date-wise or whatever, uh, day of the week-wise. Anyway, so on that day I said, even though we just got stopped out today, and this is once again making a decision, it's really hard to go back to the well. And I talked about this in prior presentations. If you're in a setup and you get knocked out at a profit and you go back a second time, you get a loss, it's like, oh crap, it's gonna make you feel kind of bad. If you get knocked out of the loss the first time, you go back in and get uh, a loss the second time, or it turns out to be a loser the second time once again, then you're really going to feel like the definition of insanity and you feel pretty stupid about it all. But again, that's where making the decision and living with them comes to mind. And I was a little nervous putting it back out there for you guys, okay? But I, I reasoned that even though we just got stopped out today, I think it's a worthwhile I think it's worthwhile as a new position. And then I went on to say, nice uptrend, nice deep pullback. And once again, the great thing with a deep, the great thing with a deep pullback, like a textbook TKO, is that sometimes they trigger, I went on to say, I forgot to put it in here, but uh, I have it right here. Sometimes they trigger, they don't trigger and the, and the market just keeps 
dropping. So anyway, let's take a look at what happened. So on the first trade, we banked a thousand, we trailed the stop higher, got it to break even, okay? And then we continued to trail it higher, got stopped out at 2,500 per 100K plus the 1,000, so that's 3,500 on the first trade. And then a second trade, once again, hit the IPT. Unfortunately, this time, though, it just came down and stopped us out. Yeah, two days after it stopped out, it went up 20-something points. But they're holding through that big slide would not have made sense, unfortunately, okay? The shit happens. Sometimes the market will take off without you. The good thing is we were in the hunt. We were there. The bad thing is we got knocked out. But maybe next time we won't get knocked out. There's no remorse in where I put my stop. And if anything, I let my stops get so loose to try to hang on these longer term trends. And every now and then we'll get one, we'll sit, we'll sit it out for a couple of years. And it makes me a little nervous. Like sometimes I'll go like, oh man, that stop is so far away. That's gonna suck when it finally gets hit. When you start feeling those feelings, it's probably far enough away to ride out corrections. And if you do get hit, it's going down so far the market has probably reversed. So I, I don't usually have a lot of those type of regrets in the post-mortem phase as far as where my stop was, where my entry was, et cetera. As long as everything I'm doing is conceptually correct and I'm working to adjust to the volatility of the market, then I don't let it bother me too much. So zero and second loaf, we gave it a shot. Better than the poke in the eye, right? So there's the trades down there on a mechanical basis. I think I did slightly better in my model account, and I have those trades somewhere. I don't think I have in this presentation. And that's because I put on a few more shares. I think I rounded these up to 400 on the first loaf. Anyway, you add all that up, and what's that, $4,500? So that's, that's a good little trade. I would have liked to... Um, have this thing go on for a couple of years, but if I could squeeze a little money out of a trade and then start looking for another opportunity, that's fine with me. Now, let me show you one that failed miserably that I still liked, okay? Just to not pretend that everything is rosy, right? Major, major long-term bottoming action here, not shown, okay? I love to see this type of action, huge big picture bottom. It's taken off from lows, nice little textbook. TKO, a nice little TKO almost textbook. So I was talking about this right here, this TKO bar there on that particular day. And you could see it ended up failing miserably. Well, I went back and looked at this one and everything I said, I thought still looked pretty good and it happens. And yeah, I dropped an F-bomb, but I was able to move on. Now, what I was talking about earlier is you wanna drag this chart back to this day here, okay? And then go through it bar by bar and check it out. Now I've done that throughout my career. I don't do it as much anymore because I feel confident going in and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Rarely do I feel like, damn, why didn't I do more analysis? I felt like, I, I kind of feel like I go through the, um, go through all the steps to justify the setups. But this one didn't work, even though I thought it would. Anyway, you can find these at daylearn.com slash archives. And it's a good exercise if I say to myself in going through these. If you're new to the service, go through the last several weeks to get a feel for what's going on, good, bad, and indifferent. And then go through as many as you can stand further back. But if you're if you're new to trading and you don't want to spend a lot of money learning, or try if you're trying to learn my methodology, that is. We could, we could shorten your learning curve if you will willing to become a member of the site and a member of Dave Landry's Trend Traders in Facebook. But if you don't want to put that money up front, get to know me first by looking at these archives and, and, and kind of see how I think about these things. Those, those little quotes that I said earlier, you'll see that on each one of these setups. Now, not to digress too far, but 
what I wanted to do tonight in answering Hal's question, and we could certainly revisit it in upcoming webinars and in Facebook, of course, but I wanted to kind of build the base of better ingredients, better pizza, garbage in, garbage out, and so on and so forth. And in addition to documenting all that, and then of course doing a post-mortem and then do the time travel with the pre-mortem, you also want to document your life. So I found one of my morning pages from back when I did the presentation or one of my presentations on pre-mortems and post-mortems and all those things. And you could see just this kind of rambling. This this starts at um I get up at about 4:55, although my alarm clock is probably 15, 20 minutes fast. So I'm getting up pretty early. Uh I just got a lot going on. I have to get up early, but I, and I got to get out of my head in the mornings. And this this writing is is the best thing I've ever done. And you could see that I'm recognizing dangers and pitfalls of what's going on. I had a good week, evidently. And then just various things in my head. Psychology of winning and gambling versus being prudent. Some things that are happening. Okay, things are conducive. Don't let it go to my head is what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, my writing is usually atrocious, but it's, it has become better and better since I've got this tablet. And if I take my time, I can actually write really well. My daughter was visiting once and she wanted to know what font I was using. I'm like, that's my handwriting, believe it or not. But it gets really sloppy as soon as I try to speed up. So getting back to his question, he's basically wondering if if I feel like uh, my stop was too tight or my entry was too close and so on and so forth. I've when I go into a trade, I've accepted all those things already. And through the pre-mortem, I'm like, okay, if this thing fails miserably, am I going to just shout next and say the hell with it? Or is it going to really stress me out? And that kind of saves me from all of that second guessing. And the the one thing that pre, the post-mortem will do is all of a sudden it's going to reveal all these things like, oh, wait, the trend really wasn't that great. Or, wow, I did put my entry too close or my stop too close. All these things that I think Hal is alluding to. But I think if you work harder and get a little experience, you're not going to worry so much about those or those things aren't really going to affect you as much in the post-mortem. And if they do, then just say, well, from now on, this stock had an HV of whatever, 80-something or 100-something. And I was using the two point stop, which was way too close. So next time, just don't do that. Okay. So we can come back to this. I feel like I kind of went around this question a little bit, but but I think it's more important to build the base to get to the answer. And hopefully that made sense. All right, let's hop into crypto real quick. Any questions or thoughts or any any of that? And we'll take a look at crypto real quick. I haven't been paying probably enough attention to crypto. Like I say, each week, it changes really fast, okay? So sometimes a day or two, all of a sudden, these things are going straight up again. So I need to start paying attention again. Bitcoin did find some support down here. It went below its 30, broke below this base, but it did find support. So I wouldn't rush out and buy it because the net net is sideways, right? We've gone sideways for months in here. But it is kind of hanging in there. I think I'm a closet bull longer term. I wouldn't rush out and buy it again now. But it has been kind of consolidating and it, and it hasn't come unglued. They had a few probes lower. And it seems like on these probes, somebody is coming in and picking it up a little bit. Not that you want to trade just off of that. Let's take a look at, let me just punch it up real quick, Ethereum. So Ethereum kind of just meandering lower and it's pretty much sideways. Let's take a look at Ethereum. Is it BTC Ethereum or ET, ETH BTC? There it is. So we take a look at Ethereum versus Bitcoin. You can see as a general statement for quite some time, it's been a lot weaker. So Bitcoin's a stronger of the two. I don't use stops as a trade only option, so it eliminates the problem of stop placement. 
Uh, well, I hear you, but if you're trading a deep in the money option, then by all means, you're going to need to figure out a place we should stop at. But the the one advantage, and believe me, it's their um, white elephant, for lack of a better better word, or there's got to be a better phrase for that. They seem too good to be true. So what's a phrase for they seem too good to be true? And a lot of times they are too good to be true. They, they're not too good to be true. What's What am I trying to say is uh, they're a lot harder than it looks. So, but it's okay if you're trading options and you say, okay, I'm going to take my loss up front. I'm going to pay one point for this option. If I lose, I lose one point. It's not going to materially impact, materially impact my life. I can live with that. Now, just real quick, I, I, I don't expect to see a whole lot, but maybe there's some stuff waking up. Yeah, see, this woke up in here. So the great thing about crypto is when it wakes up and really wakes up, you can just go in here and buy these stronger pairs. And I've just been so busy lately, I've been forgetting to 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 look at it. It's, it you know, you go you go a week or two and there's nothing to do, and then you you don't look at it as much. Um, I do look at Bitcoin every day though, I, but I, I haven't done these scans in a while, and I need to get back on them because I saw that there's a couple of things that broke out that maybe I could have picked up. All right, any questions on crypto, any pairs you want to look at? We'll go ahead and shift gears and hop into stocks. And uh, we'll get to your, yeah, keep them coming. Keep your stock picks coming. We'll get to those in just one second. Okay, let's take a look at the the overall market. And as I was telling my clients earlier tonight, although the S&P looks pretty good, and NASDAQ, for the most part, looks pretty good, there were a few kind of chinks in the armor. I'm kind of pulling my horns in a little bit based on the action. I didn't recommend any setups going into tomorrow just because I wasn't seeing a lot that really excited me. But the P's made an outside day down. It's a bit of a bummer. They had a bit of a fake out hire, came back in. It's certainly not the end of the world. And it's it's beginning to feel like we're, as I also told my clients, kind of settling into that summertime doldrums pattern, which is, this is the longest I can remember. Usually summers are just choppy and abysmal from day one, but this has actually been a pretty damn good summer. And, you know, all these sell in May people, you know, they're hurting pops, especially a few weeks ago. Let's see, sell in May, go away. Well, you know, you missed the best rally of the whole year by doing that. So be careful not to get too far sidetracked. Imagine that, you get sidetracked. <laughs> But be careful of those Wall Street adages. A lot of them are pretty much worthless. Tom McClellan actually did a presentation and he did the statistics and it's a little bit more of like sell in June as opposed to sell in May, but June doesn't rhyme. So it's less likely to be believed. If the glove, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Things that are rhymed are much more likely to be believed. Ride the wave with Dave, how's that? <laughs> Bonds, Ugh. bonds are a bit of a bummer. As you can see, they sold off fairly hard in here, pulled back, and then pff, imploded today. So that's one of the problems that I'm seeing with this market. Bonds down, rates up. Bonds sure like they want to come down here and test these lows from last year. Hopefully, I know you should never use that word in this business, but hopefully they hold. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ Composite has pulled back a little bit more deeply than the P's. It's lost a little bit more steam. Technology is kind of losing steam in here. One of you guys was talking about that earlier today. Was it Hal or was it uh, George? I think it was George. And yeah, I agree with you on that. Good observation. It, it helps to have extra set of eyes out there, especially trend following type of people. I'd say trend following morons. I don't know if all you identify as TFMs, but I certainly do. <laughs> At T following moron is my Twitter handle. So NASDAQ, look at a little questionable in here. Not the end of the world, so far an uptrend, but yeah, pulling back to where to its prior breakout. So that's a bit of a bummer. Okay, let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty's a bit of a bummer. Outside day down today, down about a half percent, or a little less than a half percent. Kind of stalling out of the top of its range. It's got a lot of resistance up here to pump up against, and then it's got a little overhead supply to deal with. So the Rusty just can't seem to get it in gear. That's a bit of a bummer. Energies are looking a little better in here. They've finally gotten out of their range. They made new all-time closing highs today. They failed to hang on to their gains. I'd like to see them get a little bit further out, break out a little bit further, and then 
as we start seeing pullbacks, see if there's anything worthwhile. There's one on land list tonight, but I'm just not that excited about it. The banks have pulled back in here recently. I don't want to rush out and buy banks, but based on the debacle that we had not that long ago, it's good to see them coming back. But unfortunately, they're sort of rolling back over again. So we'll have to pay attention to that. Maybe you keep your bow ties handy there. And if we cross over to the downside, we might have some concerns with the banks. Financials still look okay, but like the P's and some other areas, have lost some steam. And financials, unfortunately, kind of stalled just a little bit higher than this prior peak in here. So that's got me a little bit concerned. Drugs getting back to the positives, off their best levels today, but just a, a smidge off of, I almost said something I shouldn't say. <laughs> Used to sail, and they would say when, the, when you want to bring the sail in about that much, they had a word, a phrase, I should say. <laughs> but I'm not going to say it. But yeah, it's down a smidge today. We'll use that instead. So drugs look pretty good. They finally got out of this range. Pretty excited about that. Biotechnology kind of waking up, but then came back in. So it's still got its work cut out for it. It's got to get past these prior peaks in here. Uh, as a general statement, I'm kind of a biotech bull. Kind of been a biotech bull for my whole life, my whole trading life at least. But I have to admit, we got a little resistance here. Multiple peaks get past, and then a whole lot of overhead supply so hard to get too excited about that some areas like manufacturing and m and c still looking pretty good although it would see did get kind of whacked today and you can see it's starting to lose some momentum like some of those other areas and as i sort of alluded to you might want to dust off your bow ties and keep an eye on them also keep an eye on that 30 ema that can really help to keep you especially with combined with landry light on the right side of the market. Look at the Landry light here. You had Landry light from here all the way to here. So, you, and then the Qs, like I was saying in Twitter, we had um, like 70 something days of Landry light. That was the biggest run that we had since the pandemic. So it's not completely um, unfathomable that the market would pull back. And consolidate, but you can see the NASDAQ has lost some steam in here as of late. And you go all the way back to let's see when that is all the way back there. And you can see the net net is actually negative going all the way back to the middle of June. So, what's that a month and a half? So, that's not uh, too good, almost two months. So, that's a little concerning. Let's take a look at the transports. Like I've been saying, the transports have lost steam in here. Yeah, there's still an uptrend, but they've lost steam. And again, let's pay attention to these bow ties, okay? Just in case I get hit by a beer truck over the weekend or tomorrow, <laughs> then um, you guys will know to pay attention to your bow ties and pay attention to that 30 EMA Landry light. Those two things can really help to keep you out of a lot of trouble. Speaking of bow ties, you can see uh, the, I'm sorry, software. This is an area I've been pretty bullish on for a while, but now it's beginning to kind of roll over. And keep in mind, I'm not going crazy bearish on you just yet. I'm just showing you, like I said a minute ago, that some chinks in the armor, some things I'm watching, some things I'm concerned about. And in this business, obviously, there's always something to worry about. Now, the semiconductors, they've been a real a bit of a bummer in here. And you can see these bow ties. As soon as the close closes below an exponential moving average, the exponential moving average will turn down. Greg Morris taught me that. That's math. That's mathematics. The simple sometimes takes a little bit longer to catch up. I do like the relationship of the 10 simple against the 20 and the 30 for my bow ties. And that's what they are. 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. And I know a lot of you guys have experimented with other ones, and that's cool. But these are the ones that I found years ago, and I just tend to like them the best. But you can see semis have lost some steam. And, and here's the other thing I, I don't want to think about too much, but you can see that semis got thwarted right at these all-time highs. Now, maybe because it looks like such an obvious double top, maybe the market is just kind of faking out everybody and it's going to go straight back up. We'll have to wait and see. But based on this action, I wouldn't rush out and buy any semiconductor stocks. Or if I found the mother of all setups, I would make sure I wait for an entry and then maybe use an intro. A liberal, liberal, yeah, a liberal entry at that. I cannot talk tonight for some reason. All right, let's take a look at some stocks, and then um, we'll see what else is happening. 
Which one would be a good one? To do? Oh, Landry List would be a good one. Oh, okay. Let's take a look at uh, Coin. And the question is too much of a pullback. Um, yeah, you answered your own question. So here's the issue, okay? We just cleared these these two little peaks in here, okay? So technically, that was kind of a trading range, right? And then we got out of the trading range. We only had one day where it broke out of that trading range. So that's a one-day trend. And then it's come all the way back into the trading range. So yeah, I would, I would pass on that. But hog, that's what, Harley Davidson? Well, you know, you know what? See, Zach likes motorcycles. So that's why he bought Hog. I'm willing to bet. Because let's see if technically it makes any sense. Well, technically, it's kind of all over the place. I mean, I hear you. It did rally from lows. You bought puts? No, I, I disagree. You bought an out of the money call about 36 a month ago. All right, month somewhere over here, 36. Okay, well, that worked. But look at the overhead supply you had. So you kind of got lucky on that one. That expires in 50 days was going in my favor. Now it's down and my account has taken a hit. Any thoughts? Uh, well, it's, it's you know, you, you said you don't use stops and options, but it doesn't look that good anymore and didn't look that good to begin with. And did you buy it because you like Harley Davidson's? I heard that if you get one and it doesn't leak oil, they'll they'll send somebody down to make sure it leaks oil. <laughs> now I heard they're I heard they're fantastic. You know, boy, I'm gonna get some feedback on that one. Uh no, I heard they're much better now. Okay. I'm my wife won't allow me to have a motorcycle, so maybe I'm just jealous. But yeah, um, you know, you're what I'm hearing from you, Zach, is you didn't make plans going in, okay? So it, it's really hard to 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 make plans after the fact because no matter what you do, it's going to be the wrong thing. And I kind of alluded to this earlier. I don't have regrets in the post mortem about where I entered and where I put the stop and how I trailed the stop in the setup in and of itself. I mean, every now and then, maybe, okay? But for the most part, because I qualify and quantify everything as much as possible, I'm very happy going in. I do that time travel. You know, EOSE, I drop some F-bombs, okay? But it was such a bigger picture setup. If you back this thing way out, and I know it's like the cleanest in the world, but I just love this huge basin here. And, you know, you see a stock down here at single digits, four and change or whatever. This thing could easily have ran to 20 or 30, you know? So was it worth it? Yes. Am I upset? Yes. Did I drop an F-bomb? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. <laughs> Kava. I like Kava. Um, it's on the Landry list, but we'll talk about it. The only thing I don't like is this uh, this kind of funky bar right here. And it's kind of kind of chopping back and forth. But for the most part, yes, I like it. It did pull back to where it broke out. I tend to be a little bit more lenient in IPOs. Uh, I think it's okay. I, I wouldn't fault you for trading that. John is a resident IPO expert in the group. So the only thing that's just that I'm kind of picking apart is this kind of this, this funky bar back here and the fact that it pulled back to the top of this thing. Uh, I think if, if this pulled back, if this run was bigger and this pullback was above this breakout a little more, I mean, a lot of ifs, okay? And, and one thing I talked about recently, oh, no, not a problem, John, it's okay. Uh, one thing I talked about recently, and I actually wrote about it, 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 I, think it I think it turned out okay. And I'll, I'll share it with you guys once I get these things fleshed out a little. But uh, one thing I wrote about was in the Facebook group, especially when we were going through that choppy phase in the market, and I couldn't find a setup to save my life. You guys were coming up with setups, but you were saying, I like this setup, but, and then I like this, but, but, you know, and then it's like, well, watch your butts. And, and this is one where I kind of got a couple of butts in it, so to speak. And that sounds kind of bizarre. But as soon as I start hearing myself say, but, then I know maybe I need to double, double think this setup. And then maybe I need to do the time travel and say, okay, 
if I fail miserably on this, am I going to be upset because I had these butts back then, you know? And that's that's kind of where my 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 hey trend of thought. That's actually the name of the book I'm working on. That's where my uh, train of thought is on this, or trend of thought, so to speak. So um, I'm going to give you a not bad on that one, and that's why I put it in Landry list because I thought it was worth a shot. But I, it's for as making it official. It's like, eh, it's just not quite there. Okay, car. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, you're right here off of all time highs. I think it's okay. I would have preferred if you had more than just these two wide range bars coming up into this trend. But for the most part, I think it looks okay. You have pulled all the way back to this prior breakout in here. So that combined with the fact that you're just kind of barely clearing these prior highs in here would have me a little bit concerned. It's just not jumping out at me as like an F yeah type of setup. But conceptually, I really can't fault you on that one because it does look pretty good. But I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off. So uh, by the way, Zach, getting back to your hog trade, or let's just talk about options trades in general. Now, if you're buying like a, a way out of the money option, what I like to do, or even slightly out of the money, as opposed to a deep in the money, those a deep in the money option needs to be managed more like uh, a, the underlying position because you're going to have a delta of 100. What I do with an out of the money type of option, if you play that game, which is dangerous, obviously, but what I do is I put in, let's say I, I buy those for one point, okay? Well, make sure you're buying at least two options and then put in a limit order to flip out one option at a double, okay? And if you get a move, even if it's on noise and loan, okay, or lucky, and it and it goes up and all of a sudden that option doubles in price, well, you sell half of the position and now you've got a free option and now you don't have to worry as much about losing money on the position because you're already, it's at a scratch and you're playing with the market's money, so to speak. I know it's a dangerous way to look at things, but as long as the stock is 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 performing well, and, and obviously hog isn't, but that, op that option probably evaporated by now, so who cares, okay? So just leave it on the books, and uh, they might come out with some good earnings or bad earnings or whatever makes them go up, and you might get paid. So just make sure you're positioning yourself to where you could use proper money management it's like i'm i'm talking with someone in the gym younger fellow and he's looking to work with a prop firm and he's having some issues because of the way the the, the trailing stop works in a prop firm if you go up a thousand bucks and you come back down to zero for the day and they've got a fifteen hundred dollar trailing stop well you took a thousand dollars out of that trailing stop and now you only have five hundred dollars of work with tomorrow even if you make a little money in a trade the trailing stop for your drawdown, your trailing drawdown comes up. So what I told him to try to work on that, and I know he's gonna, I know he's just getting started, so he's gotta be careful, but maybe try to put on a couple of contracts while he's in the learning phase and take profits on one and get the stop to break even on the other. So let's say he's made, he makes uh, $200 on the first loaf and then stops out. Well, his drawdown did not come up by 200. Dollars. I think that's the way that works, but it sure seems like they figured out a way to kind of kind of put you out of business. It kind of reminds me of the bucket shop days. And if you guys have different experiences with this trailing drawdown thing, I'm a little fascinated with the prop stuff. I, I don't think I would ever do it myself. Never say never. I don't see any reason to do it myself, but it's kind of interesting and I'm kind of fascinated with it. With it. And so far, I, I'm, I'm super skeptical, skeptical. So if somebody's got some experience, let me know tonight. Also, uh, leave a comment below. I would love to uh, continue that conversation and, and, and learn a little bit from you because it's, it's very, uh, I find it very fascinating and I'm kind of keeping an eye on this kid. And I hope he, um, I hope he does really well. I say kid, I think he's, I think he's fresh out of high school, which is always, I'm always excited when, when young folk uh, like Zach in here tonight is, um, is into the markets. <laughs> Okay, so you always you always buy two and sell the first at 100%. Yeah, that's cool. The other thing you might do, Zach, is 
is treated just like you would if it goes in the money especially treat it just like you would the underlying stock so if you need to get out of the stock if you were long the stock and you would have gotten stopped out at a reasonable trailing stop then by all means go ahead and exit your option if you get the ipt on your option the double or whatever and all of a sudden it comes right back in and that option is pretty much worthless on your books just just leave it on your books and see what happens okay Maybe the company will get bought out. I mean, you know, it could happen. I could have taken profits while I was in the money, but I wanted to let it ride. Well, okay, that's where you need to, again, garbage in, garbage out, and, and your planning is, is best done ahead of time. So kind of figure it out ahead of time, how are you going to manage that position? and take all the, the guesswork out. Because if you try to manage things on a fly, it's gonna create a lot of animosity. It's, it's gonna create a lot of shoulda, coulda, woulda. And you're going to set yourself up for failure. Whereas if I have a plan in place and I follow that plan, it's like, well, the plan didn't work. I know I followed the process like I should have. Shit happens and you get over with it. But it's like, ah, should I loosen it up? Should I let it ride? Let me give it one more day. Let me just, okay, it hit the stop. Let me give it a little room. Oh, it didn't reverse. Okay, now it's down 25 cents, 35 cents, 45 cents. Well, let me just let it go tomorrow. And before you know it, I call it stop creep. You know, you just keep letting that stop creep creep away from the position. And before you know it, you're in a lot of trouble, especially with, with an outright position, obviously. So you thought it was a good setup. Okay, well, okay. Um Usually I ask people in the group because <laughs> I don't want to run a client way, but uh, I ask clients in the group, you know, hey, I notice uh, I'm not too keen on your setups. Do you mind tough love? And if you don't mind tough love, I'll beat you up. So John says they haven't leaked since the 80s. So they're better now. Do you drive? You have a bike, John? So that's an old joke. All right. Well, good. You know, I like to see American brand do good. Don't get me wrong. RRC, okay, well, RRC is going to be energy stock. Um, energy stocks can be kind of wide and loose. You've got this kind of wide and loose trading back here. Uh, I'm not too excited about this one. It looks okay. I see what you're saying. It's got a little acceleration higher. It needs a little bit deeper pullback, and if it pulls back a little more deeply, then you're back into the range. So I would go ahead and pass on that one, Keith. And uh, knockout, no, it's not enough knockout move. You need a big, kind of a big fat wide range bar down like like this bar here you see a big wide range bar down plus that's in a pullback okay so the combination of those two you got two bikes cool all right <laughs> i can't pick on harleys anymore <laughs> cool i knew i liked you john <laughs> all right any more while we're in the impasse, obviously, I want to thank everybody for watching tonight. Anything in the answered, DavidAvelander.com. If you're not a member of Facebook, if you are a member of Facebook, just bring it up there. If it's something that you don't mind sharing with the group, we'll be happy to noodle with it and uh, leave a comment below. Hey, if you like this video, like this video. If you don't like this video, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> and uh, subscribe to my channel while you're here. Uh, everybody have a great weekend and uh, all you guys and girls here tonight i'll see you tomorrow in facebook thank you so much you're welcome